Section 33 of History of Egypt, Volume 2, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. The First Theban Empire, Part 9. Bubastus had no less occasion than Tanis to boast of the generosity of the Theban pharaohs. The Temple of Bastet, which had been decorated by Cheops and Kephren, was still in existence. Amenemhiat I, Usertasen I, and their immediate successors confined themselves to the restoration of several chambers, and to the erection of their own statues, but Usertasen III added to it a new structure which must have made it rival the finest monuments in Egypt. He believed no doubt that he was under particular obligations to the lioness goddess of the city, and attributed to her aid, for unknown reasons, some of his successes in Nubia. It would appear that it was with the spoil of a campaign against the country of the Hua that he endowed a part of the new sanctuary. Nothing now remains of it except fragments of the architraves and granite columns, which have been used over again by pharaohs of a later period, when restoring or altering the fabric. A few of the columns belong to the lotiform type. The shaft is composed of eight triangular stalks rising from a bunch of leaves, symmetrically arranged and bound together at the top by a ribbon twisted thrice round the bundle the capital is formed by the union of the eight lotus buds surmounted by a square member on which rests the architrave other columns have hathor headed capitals the heads being set back to back and bearing the flat headdress ornamented with the urus the face of the goddess which is somewhat flattened when seen closely on the eye level stands out and becomes more lifelike in proportion as the spectator recedes from it. The projection of the features has been calculated so as to produce the desired effect at the right height, when seen from below. The district lying between Tanis and Bubastis is thickly studded with monuments built or embellished by the Amenemhiats and Usertasans. Wherever the pickaxe is applied, whether at Fakas or Tel Nebeshesh, remains of them are brought to light. Statues, stele, tables of offerings, and fragments of dedicatory or historical inscriptions. While carrying on works in the temple of Ptah at Memphis, the attention of these pharaohs was attracted to Heliopolis. The temple of Ra there was either insufficient for the exigencies of worship, or had been allowed to fall into decay. Usertasen III resolved, in the third year of his reign, to undertake its restoration. The occasion appears to have been celebrated as a festival by all Egypt, and the remembrance of it lasted long after the event. The somewhat detailed account of the ceremonies which then took place was copied out again at Thebes, towards the end of the eighteenth dynasty. It describes the king mounting his throne at the meeting of his council, and receiving, as was customary, the eulogies of his sole friends and of the courtiers who surrounded him. Here, says he, addressing them, has my majesty ordained the works which shall recall my worthy and noble acts to posterity. I raise a monument, I establish lasting decrees in favor of Harmachus, for he has brought me into the world to do as he did, to accomplish that which he decreed should be done. He has appointed me to guide this earth, he has known it, he has called it together, and he has granted me his help. I have caused the eye which is in him to become serene, in all things acting as he would have me to do, and I have sought out that which he had resolved should be known. I am a king by birth, a suzerain not of my own making. I have governed from childhood. Petitions have been presented to me when I was in the egg. I have ruled over the ways of Anubis, and he raised me up to be master of the two halves of the world. From the time when I was a nursling, I had not yet escaped from the swaddling bands when he enthroned me as master of men. Creating me himself in the sight of mortals, he made me to find favor with the dweller in the palace. When I was a youth, I came forth as Horus the eloquent, and I have instituted divine obligations. I accomplish the works in the palace of my father, Atumu. I supply his altar on earth with offerings. I lay the foundations of my palace in his neighborhood, in order that the memorial of my goodness may remain in his dwelling. For this palace is my name, this lake is my monument. All that is famous or useful that I have made for the gods is eternity. The great lords testified their approbation of the king's piety, the latter summoned his chancellor and commanded him to draw up the deeds of gift and all the documents necessary for the carrying out of his wishes. He arose, adorned with the royal circlet and with the double feather, followed by all his nobles. The chief lector of the divine book stretched the cord and fixed the stake in the ground. 
This temple has ceased to exist, but one of the granite obelisks raised by Usertasen I on each side of the principal gateway is still standing. The whole of Heliopolis has disappeared. The site where it formerly stood is now marked only by a few almost imperceptible inequalities in the soil, some crumbling lengths of walls, and here and there some scattered blocks of limestone, containing a few lines of mutilated inscriptions which can with difficulty be deciphered. The obelisk has survived even the destruction of ruins, and to all who understand its language it still speaks of the pharaoh who erected it. The undertaking and successful completion of so many great structures had necessitated a renewal of the working of the ancient quarries, and the opening of fresh ones. Amenemhiath I sent Antuf, a great dignitary, chief of the prophets of Minu and prince of Koptos, to the valley of Ruhanu, to seek out fine granite for making the royal sarcophagi. Amenemhiath III had, in the forty-third year of his reign, been present at the opening of several fine veins of white limestone in the quarries of Tura, which probably furnished material for the buildings proceeding at Heliopolis and Memphis. Thebes had also its share of both limestone and granite, and Ammon, whose sanctuary up to this time had only attained the modest proportions suited to a provincial god, at last possessed a temple which raised him to the rank of the highest feudal divinities. Ammon's career had begun under difficulties. He had been merely a vassal god of Montu, lord of Hermonthus, the Aunu of the south, who had granted to him the ownership of the village of Karnak only. The unforeseen good fortune of the Antufs was the occasion of his emerging from his obscurity. He did not dethrone Montu, but shared with him the homage of all the neighboring villages, Luxor, Medamut, Bayadea, and, on the other side of the Nile, Gurna and Medinet Habu. The accession of the twelfth dynasty completed his triumph, and made him the most powerful authority in southern Egypt. He was an earth god, a form of Minu who reigned at Koptos, at Akmim, and in the desert, but he soon became allied to the sun, and from thenceforth he assumed the name of Amun-Ra. The title of Sutan Nutiru, which he added to it, would alone have sufficed to prove the comparatively recent origin of his notoriety. As the latest arrival among the great gods, he employed, to express his sovereignty, this word Sutan, king, which had designated the rulers of the valley ever since the union of the two Egypts under the shadowy Menes. Reigning at first alone, he became associated by marriage with a vague, indefinite goddess, called Mot, or Mut, the mother, who never adopted any more distinctive name. The divine son who completed this triad was, in early times, Montu, but in later times a being of secondary rank, chosen from among the genie appointed to watch over the days of the month or the stars, was added, under the name of Khonsu. Amenemhiath laid the foundations of the temple, in which the cultus of Amun was carried on down to the latest times of paganism. The building was supported by polygonal columns of sixteen sides, some fragments of which are still standing. The temple was at first of only moderate dimensions, but it was built of the choicest sandstone and limestone, and decorated with exquisite bas-reliefs. Usertasen I enlarged it, and built a beautiful house for the high priest on the west side of the sacred lake. Luxor, Zorit, Edfu, Hieraconpolis, El Kab, Elephantine, and Dendera shared between them the favor of the pharaohs. The venerable town of Abydos became the object of their special predilection. Its reputation for sanctity had been steadily growing from the time of the poppies. Its god, Contamentit, who was identified with Osiris, had obtained in the south a rank as high as that of the Mendesian Osiris in the north of Egypt. He was worshipped as the sovereign of the sovereigns of the dead, he who gathered around him and welcomed in his domains the majority of the faithful of other cults. His sepulchre, or more correctly speaking, the chapel representing his sepulchre, in which one of his relics was preserved, was here as elsewhere built upon the roof. Access to it was gained by a staircase leading up on the left side of the sanctuary. On the days of the Passion and Resurrection of Osiris, solemn processions of priests and devotees slowly mounted its steps, to the chanting of funeral hymns, and above on the terrace, away from the world of the living, and with no other witnesses than the stars of heaven, the faithful celebrated mysteriously the rites of the divine death and embalming. The vassals of Osiris flocked in crowds to these festivals, 
and took a delight in visiting, at least once during their lifetime, the city whither their souls would proceed after death, in order to present themselves at the mouth of the cleft, there to embark in the bari of their divine master or in that of the sun. They left behind them, under the staircase of the great god, a sort of fictitious tomb, near the representation of the tomb of Osiris, in the shape of a stele, which immortalized the memory of their piety, and which served as a kind of hostelry for their soul, when the latter should, in course of time, repair to this rallying place of all Osirian souls. The concourse of pilgrims was a source of wealth to the population. The priestly coffers were filled, and every year the original temple was felt to be more and more inadequate to meet the requirements of worship. Usertasen I desired to come to the rescue. He dispatched Montapu, one of his great vassals, to superintend the works. The ground plan of the portico of white limestone which preceded the entrance court may still be distinguished. This portico was supported by square pillars, and standing against the remains of these, we see the colossi of rose granite, crowned with the Osirian headdress, and with their feet planted on the nine bows, the symbol of vanquished enemies. The best preserved of these figures represents the founder, but several others are likenesses of those of his successors who interested themselves in the temple. Matthapu dug a well which was kept fully supplied by the infiltrations from the Nile. He enlarged and cleaned out the sacred lake upon which the priests launched the holy ark, on the nights of the great mysteries. The alluvial deposits of fifty centuries have not as yet wholly filled it up. It is still an irregularly shaped pond, which dries up in winter, but is again filled as soon as the inundation reaches the village of El Carba. A few stones, corroded with saltpetre, mark here and there the lines of the landing stages. A thick grove of palms fringes its northern and southern banks, but to the west the prospect is open, and extends as far as the entrance to the gorge, through which the souls set forth in search of paradise and the solar bark. Buffaloes now come to drink and wallow at midday where once floated the gilded bari of Osiris, and the murmur of bees from the neighboring orchards alone breaks the silence of the spot, which of old resounded with the rhythmical lamentations of the pilgrims. End of section 33. Read by Professor Heather Mumbai. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 34 of History of Egypt, Volume 2, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. The First Theban Empire, Part 10. Heracleopolis the Great, the town preferred by the earlier Theban pharaohs as their residence in times of peace, must have been one of those which they proceeded to decorate con amore, with magnificent monuments. Unfortunately, it has suffered more than any of the rest, and nothing of it is now to be seen but a few wretched remains of buildings of the Roman period, and the ruins of a barbaric colonnade on the site of a Byzantine basilica almost contemporary with the Arab conquest. Perhaps the enormous mounds which cover its site may still conceal the remains of its ancient temples. We can merely estimate their magnificence by casual allusions to them in the inscriptions. We know, for instance, that Usertasen III rebuilt the sanctuary of Harshafitu, and that he sent expeditions to the Wadi Hammamat to quarry blocks of granite worthy of his god. But the work of this king, and his successors, has perished in the total ruin of the ancient town. Something, at least, has remained of what they did in that traditional dependency of Heracleopolis, the Fayum. The temple which they built to the god Sabku in Shadit retained its celebrity down to the time of the Caesars, not so much perhaps on account of the beauty of its architecture, as for the unique character of the religious rites which took place there daily. The sacred lake contained a family of tame crocodiles, the image and incarnation of the god, whom the faithful fed with their offerings, cakes, fried fish, and drinks sweetened with honey. Advantage was taken of the moment when one of these creatures, wallowing on the bank, basked contentedly in the sun. Two priests opened his jaws, and a third threw in the cakes, the fried morsels, and finally the liquid. The crocodile bore all this without even winking. He swallowed down his provender, plunged into the lake, and lazily reached the opposite bank, hoping to escape for a few moments from the oppressive liberality of his devotees. As soon, however, as another of these approached, he was again beset at his new post and stuffed in a similar manner. 
these animals were in their own way great dandies. Rings of gold or enameled terracotta were hung from their ears, and bracelets were soldered onto their front paws. The monuments of Chaudit, if any still exist, are buried under the mounds of Medinet al Fayum, but in the neighborhood we meet with more than one authentic relic of the twelfth dynasty. It was Usertasen I who erected that curious thin granite obelisk, with a circular top, whose fragments lie forgotten on the ground near the village of Begig. A sort of basin has been hollowed out around it, which fills during the inundation, so that the monument lies in a pool of muddy water during the greater part of the year. Owing to this treatment, most of the inscriptions on it have almost disappeared, though we can still make out a series of five scenes in which the king hands offerings to several divinities. Near to Biahmu there was an old temple which had become ruinous. Amenemhayat III repaired it, and erected in front of it two of those colossal statues which the Egyptians were wont to place like sentinels at their gates, to ward off baleful influences and evil spirits. The colossi at Biahmu were of red sandstone, and were seated on high limestone pedestals, placed at the end of a rectangular court. The temple walls hid the lower part of the pedestals, so that the colossi appeared to tower above a great platform, which sloped gently away from them on all sides. Herodotus, who saw them from a distance at the time of the inundation, believed that they crowned the summits of two pyramids rising out of the middle of a lake. Near Ilahun, Queen Savkanov Fury herself has left a few traces of her short reign. The Fayum, by its fertility and pleasant climate, justified the preference which the pharaohs of the twelfth dynasty bestowed upon it. On emerging from the gorges of Ilahun, it opens out like a vast amphitheatre of cultivation, whose slopes descend towards the north till they reach the desolate waters of the Burkit Karund. On the right and left, the amphitheatre is isolated from the surrounding mountains by two deep ravines, filled with willows, tamarisks, mimosas, and thorny acacias. Upon the high ground, lands devoted to the culture of corn, dura, and flax, alternate with groves of palms and pomegranates, vineyards and gardens of olives, the latter being almost unknown elsewhere in Egypt. The slopes are covered with cultivated fields, irregularly terraced woods, and meadows enclosed by hedges, while lofty trees, clustered some places and thinly scattered in others, rise in billowy masses of verdure one behind the other. Shodit, or Shadu, stood on a peninsula stretching out into a kind of natural reservoir, and was connected with the mainland by a merely a narrow dike. The water of the inundation flowed into this reservoir and was stored here during the autumn. Countless little rivulets escaped from it, not merely such canals and ditches as we meet with in the Nile Valley, but actual running brooks, coursing and babbling between the trees, spreading out here and there into pools of water, and in places forming little cascades like those of our own streams, but dwindling in volume as they proceeded, owing to constant drains made on them, until they were for the most part absorbed by the soil before finally reaching the lake. They brought down in their course part of the fertilizing earth accumulated by the inundation, and were thus instrumental in raising the level of the soil. The water of the burqa rose or fell according to the season of the year. It formerly occupied a much larger area than it does at present, and half of the surrounding districts was covered by it. Its northern shores, now deserted and uncultivated, then shared in the benefits of the inundation, and supplied the means of existence for a civilized population. In many places we still find the remains of villages, and walls of uncemented stone. A small temple even has escaped the general ruin, and remains almost intact in the midst of the desolation, as if to point out the furthest limit of Egyptian territory. It bears no inscriptions, but the beauty of the materials of which it is composed, and the perfection of the work, led us to attribute its construction to some prince of the twelfth dynasty. An ancient causeway runs from its entrance to what was probably at one time the original margin of the lake. The continual sinking of the level of the burqa has left this temple isolated at the edge of the Libyan plateau, and all life has retired from the surrounding district, and has concentrated itself on the southern shores of the lake. Here the banks are low, and the bottom deepens almost imperceptibly. In winter the retreating waters leave exposed long patches of the shore, upon which a thin crust of snow-white salt is deposited, concealing the depths of mud and the quicksands beneath. 
Immediately after the inundation, the lake regains in a few days the ground it had lost. It encroaches on the tamarisk bushes which fringe its banks, and the district is soon surrounded by a belt of marshy vegetation, affording cover for ducks, pelicans, wild geese, and a score of different kinds of birds, which disport themselves there by the thousand. The pharaohs, when tired of residing in cities, here found varied and refreshing scenery, an equable climate, gardens always gay with flowers, and in the thickets of the Karen they could pursue their favorite pastimes of interminable fishing and of hunting with the boomerang. They desired to repose after death among the scenes in which they had lived. Their tombs stretch from Heracleopolis till they nearly meet the last pyramids of the Memphites. At Dashur there are still two of them standing. The northern one is an immense erection of brick, placed in close proximity to the truncated pyramid, but nearer than it to the edge of the plateau, so as to overlook the valley. We might be tempted to believe that the Theban kings, in choosing a site immediately to the south of the spot where Poppy the Second slept in his glory, were prompted by the desire to renew the traditions of the older dynasties prior to those of the Heracleopolitans, and thus proclaim to all beholders the antiquity of their lineage. One of their residences was situated at no great distance, near Miniet Dashur, the city of Titaui, the favorite residence of Amenemhiat I. It was here that those royal princesses, Noferhanit, Sonet Sonbit, Sithethor, and Monit, his sisters, wives, and daughters, whose tombs lie opposite the northern face of the pyramid, flourished side by side with Amenemhiat III. There, as of old in their harem, they slept side by side, and in spite of robbers, their mummies have preserved the ornaments with which they were adorned, on the eve of burial, by the pious act of their lords. The art of the ancient jewellers, which we have hitherto known only from pictures on the walls of tombs or on the boards of coffins, is here exhibited in all its cunning. The ornaments comprise a wealth of gold gorgets, necklaces of agate beads or of enameled lotus flowers, cornelian, amethyst, and onyx scarabs, pectorals of pierced gold work, inlaid with flakes of vitreous paste or precious stones, bear the cartouches of Usertasen III and of Amenemhiat II, and every one of these gems of art reveals a perfection of taste and a skillfulness of handling which are perfectly wonderful. Their delicacy and their freshness in spite of their antiquity make it hard for us to realize that fifty centuries have elapsed since they were made. We are tempted to imagine that the royal ladies to whom they belonged must still be waiting within earshot, ready to reply to our summons as soon as we deign to call them. We may even anticipate the joy they will evince when these sumptuous ornaments are restored to them, and we need to glance at the worm-eaten coffins which contain their stiff and disfigured mummies to recall our imagination to the stern reality of fact. Two other pyramids, but in this case of stone, still exist further south, to the left of the village of Lisht. Their casing, torn off by the fellaheen, has entirely disappeared, and from a distance they appear to be merely two mounds which break the desert horizon line, rather than two buildings raised by the hand of man. The sepulchre chambers, excavated at a great depth in the sand, are now filled with water which is infiltrated through the soil, and they have not as yet been sufficiently emptied to permit of an entrance being effected. One of them contained the body of Usertasen I. Does Amenemhiat I or Amenemhiat II repose in the other? We know at all events that Usertasen II built for himself the pyramid of Ilahun, and Amenemhiat III that of Hawara. Hatpu, the tomb of Usertasen II, stood upon a rocky hill at a distance of some two thousand feet from the cultivated lands. To the east of it lay a temple, and close to the temple a town, Hayit Usertasen Hatpu, the castle of the repose of Usertasen, which was inhabited by the workmen employed in building the pyramid, who resided there with their families. The remains of the temple consists of scarcely anything more than the enclosing wall, whose sides were originally faced with fine white limestone covered with hieroglyphs and sculptured scenes. It adorned the wall of the town, and the neighboring quarters are almost intact. The streets were straight and crossed each other at right angles, while the houses on each side were so regularly built that a single policeman could keep his eye on each thoroughfare from one end to the other. The structures were of rough material hastily put together, and among the debris are to be found portions of older buildings, stella, and fragments of statues. End of section 34. 
Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 35 of History of Egypt, Volume 2, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. The First Theban Empire, Part 11. The town began to dwindle after the pharaoh had taken possession of his sepulchre. It was abandoned during the thirteenth dynasty, and its ruins were entombed in the sand which the wind heaped over them. The city which Amenemhiat III had connected with his tomb maintained, on the contrary, a long existence in the course of the centuries. The king's last resting place consisted of a large sarcophagus of court Zoe's sandstone, while his favorite consort, Nofripta, reposed beside him in a smaller coffin. The sepulchre chapel was very large, and its arrangements were of a somewhat complicated character. It consisted of a considerable number of chambers, some tolerably large, and others of moderate dimensions, while all of them were difficult of access and plunged in perpetual darkness. This was the Egyptian labyrinth, to which the Greeks, by a misconception, have given a world-wide renown. Amenemhiat III, or his architects, had no intention of building such a childish structure as that in which classical tradition so fervently believed. He had richly endowed the attendant priests, and bestowed upon the cult of his double considerable revenues, and the chambers above mentioned were so many storehouses for the safekeeping of the treasure and provisions for the dead, and the arrangement of them was not more singular than that of ordinary storage depots. As his cult persisted for a long period, the temple was maintained in good condition during a considerable time. It had not, perhaps, been abandoned when the Greeks first visited it. The other sovereigns of the twelfth dynasty must have been interred not far from the tombs of Amenemhiat III and Usertasen II. They also had their pyramids, of which we may one day discover the site. The outline of these was almost the same as that of the Memphite pyramids, but the interior arrangements were different. As at Illahun and Dashur, the mass of the work consisted of crude bricks of large size, between which spine sand was introduced to bind them solidly together, and the whole was covered with a facing of polished limestone. The passages and chambers were not arranged on the simple plan which we meet with in the pyramids of earlier date. Experience had taught the pharaohs that neither granite walls nor the multiplication of barriers could preserve their mummies from profanation. No sooner was the vigilance relaxed, either in the time of civil war or under feeble administration, than robbers appeared on the scene, and boring passages through the masonry with the ingenuity of moles, they at length, after indefatigable patience, succeeded in reaching the sepulchre vault and despoiling the mummy of its valuables. With a view to further protection, the builders multiplied blind passages and chambers without apparent exit, but in which a portion of the ceiling was movable, and gave access to other equally mysterious rooms and corridors. Shafts sunk in the corners of the chambers, and again carefully closed put the sacrilegious intruder on a false scent, for, after causing him a great loss of time and labor, they only led down to the solid rock. At the present day the water of the Nile fills the central chamber of the Hawara pyramid and covers the sarcophagus. It is possible that this was foreseen, and that the builders counted on the infiltration as an additional obstacle to depredations from without. The hardness of the cement, which fastens the lid of the stone coffin to the lower part, protects the body from damp, and the pharaoh, lying beneath several feet of water, still defies the greed of the robber or the zeal of the archaeologist. The absolute power of the kings kept their feudal vassals in check. Far from being suppressed, however, the seigneurial families continued not only to exist, but to enjoy continued prosperity. Everywhere, at Elephantine, Coptos, Thinis, in Aphroditopolis, and in most of the cities of the Said and of the Delta, there were ruling princes who were descended from the old feudal lords or even from pharaohs of the Memphite period, and who were of equal, if not superior, rank to the members of the reigning family. The princes of Siut no longer enjoyed an authority equal to that exercised by their ancestors under the Heracleopolitan dynasties, but they still possessed considerable influence. One of them, Hapizophi I, excavated for himself, in the reign of Usertasen I, not far from the burying place of Kiti and Tefabi, that beautiful tomb, which, though partially destroyed by Coptic monks or Arabs, 
still attracts visitors and excites their astonishment. The lords of Shashakpu in the south, and those of Hermopolis in the north, had acquired to some extent the ascendancy which their neighbors of Siut had lost. The Hermopolit princes dated at least from the time of the Sixth Dynasty, and they had passed safely through the troublous times which followed the death of Papi II. A branch of their family possessed the nome of the Hare, while another governed that of the Gazelle. The lords of the nome of the Hare espoused the Theban cause, and were reckoned among the most faithful vassals of the sovereigns of the South. One of them, thought Totpu, caused a statue of himself, worthy of a pharaoh, to be erected in his loyal town of Hermopolis, and their burying places at El Bersha bear witness to their power no less than to their taste in art. During the troubles which put an end to the eleventh dynasty, a certain Kanum Hotpu, who was connected in some unknown manner with the lords of the Nome of the Gazelle, entered the Theban service and accompanied Amenemhiat I on his campaigns into Nubia. He obtained, as a reward of faithfulness, Maneat Kofui, and the district of Kuit Horu, the horizon of Horus, on the east bank of the Nile. On becoming possessed of the western bank also, he entrusted the government of the district which he was giving up to his eldest son, Nikiti I. But the latter having died without heirs, Usertasen I granted to Bikit, the sister of Nakiti, the rank and prerogative of a reigning princess. Bikit married Nuri, one of the princes of Hermopolis, and brought with her as her dowry the fiefdom of the gazelle, thus doubling the possessions of her husband's house. Kanumhapu II, the eldest of the children born of this union, was, while still young, appointed governor of Moneit Kufui, and this title appears to have become an appendage of his heir apparent, just as the title of Prince of Kaushu was, from the nineteenth dynasty onwards, the special designation of the heir to the throne. The marriage of Kanumhapu II with the useful Kiti, heiress of the nome of the jackal, rendered him master of one of the most fertile provinces of Middle Egypt. The power of this family was further augmented under Nikiti II, son of Kanumhapu II and Kiti. Nakiti, prince of the nome of the jackal in right of his mother, and lord of that of the gazelle after the death of his father, received from Usertasen II the administration of fifteen southern nomes, from Aphroditopolis to Thebes. This is all we know of his history, but it is probable that his descendants retained the same power and position for several generations. The career of these dignitaries depended greatly on the pharaohs with whom they were contemporary. They accompanied the royal troops on their campaigns, and with the spoil which they collected on such occasions they built temples or erected tombs for themselves. The tombs of the princes of the nome of the gazelle are disposed along the right bank of the Nile, and the most ancient are exactly opposite Minia. It is at Zawet el Mayetin and at Kam el Amar, nearly facing Hibonu, their capital, that we find the burying places of those who lived under the sixth dynasty. The custom of taking the dead across the Nile had existed for centuries, from the time when the Egyptians first cut their tombs in the eastern range. It still continues to the present day, and part of the population of Mania are now buried, year after year, in the places which their remote ancestors had chosen as the site of their eternal houses. The cemetery lies peacefully in the center of the sandy plain at the foot of the hills. A grove of palms, like a curtain drawn along the riverside, partially conceals it. A Coptic convent and a few Mohammedan hermits attract around them the tombs of their respective followers, Christian or Mussulman. The rock-hewn tombs of the twelfth dynasty succeeded each other in one long, irregular line along the cliffs of Beni Hassan, and the traveller on the Nile sees their entrances continuously coming into sight and disappearing as he goes up or descends the river. These tombs are entered by a square aperture, varying in height and width according to the size of the chapel. Two only, those of Amoni Amenemhiat and of Kanum Hapu II, have a columned façade, of which all the members, pillars, bases, and tablatures, have been cut in the solid rock. The polygonal shafts of the façade look like a bad imitation of ancient Doric. Inclined planes or flights of steps, like those at Elephantine, formerly led from the plain up to the terrace. Only a few traces of these exist at the present day, and the visitor has to climb the sandy slope as best he can. Wherever he enters, the walls present to his view inscriptions of immense extent, as well as civil, sepulchre, military, and historical scenes. 
These are not in size like those of the Memphite Mastabas, but are painted in fresco on the stone itself. The technical skill here exhibited is not a whit behind that of the older periods, and the general conception of the subjects has not altered since the time of the pyramid-building kings. The object is always the same, namely, to ensure wealth to the double in the other world, and to enable him to preserve the same rank among the departed as he enjoyed among the living, hence sowing, reaping, cattle-rearing, the exercise of different trades, the preparation and bringing of offerings, are all represented with the same minuteness as formerly. But a new element has been added to the ancient themes. We know, and the experience of the past is continually reiterating the lesson, that the most careful precautions and the most conscientious observation of customs were not sufficient to perpetuate the worship of ancestors. The day was bound to come when not only the descendants of Kunumhapu, but a crowd of curious or indifferent strangers, would visit his tomb. He desired that they should know his genealogy, his private and public virtues, his famous deeds, his court titles and dignities, the extent of his wealth, and, in order that no detail should be omitted, he relates all that he did, or he gives the impression of it upon a wall. In a long account of two hundred and twenty-two lines, he gives a resume of his family history, introducing extracts from his archives, to show the favors received by his ancestors from the hands of their sovereigns. Amoni and Kiti, who were, it appears, the warriors of their race, have everywhere recounted the episodes of their military career, the movements of their troops, their hand-to-hand -hand fights, and the fortresses to which they laid siege. The scions of the house of the gazelle and of the hare, who shared with Pharaoh himself the possession of the soil of Egypt, were no mere princely ciphers. They had a tenacious spirit, a warlike disposition, an insatiable desire for enlarging their borders, together with sufficient ability to realize their aims by court intrigues or advantageous marriage alliances. We can easily picture from their history what Egyptian feudalism really was, what were its component elements, what were the resources it had at its disposal, and we may well be astonished when we consider the power and tact which the pharaohs must have displayed in keeping such vassals in check during two centuries. End of section 35. Read by Professor Heather and by. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 36 of History of Egypt, Volume 2, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. The First Theban Empire, Part 12. Amenemhiat I had abandoned Thebes as a residence in favor of Heracleopolis and Memphis, and had made it over to some personage who probably belonged to the royal household. The nome of Usit had relapsed into the condition of a simple fife, and if we are as yet unable to establish the series of the princes who there succeeded each other contemporaneously with the pharaohs, we at least know that all those whose names have come down to us played an important part in the history of their times. Montun Sisu, whose stele was engraved in the twenty-fourth year of Amenemhiat I, and who died in the joint reign of this pharaoh and his son, Usertasen I, had taken his share in most of the wars conducted against neighboring peoples, the Anitue of Nubia, the Monitu of Sinai, and the Lords of the Sands. He had dismantled their cities and razed their fortresses. The principality retained no doubt the same boundaries which it had acquired under the first Antufs, but Thebes itself grew daily larger, and gained in importance in proportion as its frontiers extended southward. It had become, after the conquest of Usertasen III, the very centre of the Egyptian world a centre from which the power of the pharaoh could equally well extend in a northerly direction towards the Sinaitic Peninsula and Libya, or towards the Red Sea and the humiliated Kush in the south. The influence of its lords increased accordingly. Under Amenemhiat III and Amenemhiat IV, they were perhaps the most powerful of the great vassals, and when the crown slipped from the grasp of the twelfth dynasty, it fell into the hands of one of these feudatories. It is not known how the transition was brought about, which transferred the sovereignty from the elder to the younger branch of the family of Amenemhiat I. When Amenemhiat IV died, his nearest heir was a woman. His sister, Sov Knufururi, she retained the supreme authority for not quite four years, and then resigned her position to a certain Sov Kotpu. 
Was there a revolution in the palace, or a popular rising, or a civil war? Did the queen become the wife of the new sovereign, and thus bring about the change without a struggle? Sovkatpu was probably lord of Usit, and the dynasty which he founded is given by the native historians as of Theban origin. His accession entailed no change in the Egyptian constitution. It merely consolidated the Theban supremacy and gave it a recognized position. Thebes became henceforth the head of the entire country. Doubtless the kings did not at once forsake Heracleopolis and the Fayum, but they made merely passing visits to these royal residences at considerable intervals, and after a few generations even these were given up. Most of these sovereigns resided and built their pyramids at Thebes, and the administration of the kingdom became centralized there. The actual capital of a king was determined not so much by the locality from whence he ruled, as by the place where he reposed after death. Thebes was the virtual capital of Egypt from the moment that its masters fixed on it as their burying place. Uncertainty again shrouds the history of the country after Sovkotpu I. Not that monuments are lacking, or the names of kings, but the records of the many Sovkotpus and Norhotpus found in a dozen places in the valley, furnish as yet no authentic means of ascertaining in what order to classify them. The thirteenth dynasty contained, so it is said, sixty kings, who reigned for a period of over four hundred and fifty-three years. The succession did not always take place in the direct line from father to son. Several times, when interrupted by a default of male heirs, it was renewed without any disturbance, thanks to the transmission of royal rights to their children by princesses, even when their husbands did not belong to the reigning family. Monthapu, the father of Sovkotpu III, was an ordinary priest, and his name is constantly quoted by his son. But solar blood flowed in the veins of his mother, and procured for him the crown. The father of his successor, Noferhatpu II, did not belong to the reigning branch, or was only distantly connected with it. But his mother, Kamayet, was the daughter of Pharaoh, and that was sufficient to make her son of royal rank. With careful investigation we should probably find traces of several revolutions which changed the legitimate order of secession without, however, entailing a change of dynasty. The Noferhatpus and Sovkotpus continued both at home and abroad the work so ably begun by the Amenemhyats and the Usertasans. They devoted all their efforts to beautifying the principal towns of Egypt, and caused important works to be carried on in most of them at Karnak, in the great temple of Ammon, at Luxor, at Bubastis, at Tanis, at Tel Mokdam, and in the sanctuary of Abydos. At the latter place, Kasoshuri Noferhatpu restored to Kontamentit considerable possessions which the god had lost. Noziri sent hither one of his officers to restore the edifice built by Usertasen I. Sofkum Sof II dedicated his own statue in this temple, and private individuals, following the example set them by their sovereigns, vied with each other in their gifts of votive stele. The pyramids of this period were of moderate size, and those princes who abandoned the custom of building them were content, like Ataubrihoru with a modest tomb, close to the gigantic pyramids of their ancestors. In style, the statues of this epoch show a certain inferiority when compared with the beautiful work of the twelfth dynasty. The proportions of the human figures are not so good, the modelling of the limbs is not so vigorous, the rendering of the features lacks individuality, the sculptors exhibit a tendency, which had been growing since the time of the Usertasans, to represent all their sitters with the same smiling, commonplace type of countenance. There are, however, among the statues of kings and private individuals which have come down to us, a few examples of really fine treatment. The colossal statue of Sofkotpu IV, which is now in the Louvre side by side with an ordinary-sized figure of the same pharaoh, must have had a good effect when placed at the entrance to the temple at Tanis. His chest is thrown well forward, his head is erect, and we feel impressed by that noble dignity which the Memphite sculptors knew how to give to the bearing and features of the diorite Kephron enthroned at Giza. The sitting Mirmashau of Tanis lacks neither energy nor majesty, and the Sov Kum Sof of Abydos, in spite of the roughness of its execution, decidedly holds its own among the other pharaohs. The statuettes found in the tombs, and the smaller objects discovered in the ruins, are neither less carefully nor less successfully treated. 
The little scribe at Giza, in the attitude of walking, is a chef d'oeuvre of delicacy and grace, and might be attributed to one of the best schools of the twelfth dynasty, did not the inscriptions oblige us to relegate it to the Theban art of the thirteenth. The heavy and commonplace figure of the magnet now in the Vienna Museum is treated with a rather coarse realism, but exhibits nevertheless most skilful tooling. It is not exclusively at Thebes or at Tanis, or in any of the other great cities of Egypt, that we meet with excellent examples of work, or that we can prove that flourishing schools of sculpture existed at this period. Probably there is scarcely any small town which would not furnish us, at the present day, if careful excavation were carried out, with some monument or object worthy of being placed in a museum. During the thirteenth dynasty both art and everything else in Egypt were fairly prosperous. Nothing attained a very high standard, but on the other hand, nothing fell below a certain level of respectable mediocrity. Wealth exercised, however, an injurious influence upon artistic taste. The funerary statue, for instance, which Atabri Horu ordered for himself, was of ebony, and seems to have been inlaid originally with gold, whereas Cheops and Kephrin were content to have theirs of alabaster and diorite. During this dynasty we hear nothing of the inhabitants of the Sinaitic Peninsula to the east, or of the Libyans to the west. It was in the south, in Ethiopia, that the pharaohs expended all their surplus energy. The most important of them, Sofkotpu I, had continued to register the height of the Nile on the rocks of Semna, but after his time we are unable to say where the Nilometer was moved to, nor indeed who displaced it. The middle basin of the river, as far as Gebel Barkal, was soon incorporated with Egypt, and the population became quickly assimilated. The colonization of the larger islands of Say and Argo took place first, as their isolation protected them from sudden attacks. Certain princes of the thirteenth dynasty built temples there, and erected their statues within them, just as they would have done in any of the most peaceful districts of the Said or the Delta. Argo is still at the present day one of the largest of these Nubian islands. It is said to be twelve miles in length, and about two and a half in width towards the middle. It is partly wooded, and vegetation grows there with tropical luxuriance. Creeping plants climb from tree to tree, and form an almost impenetrable undergrowth, which swarms with game secure from the sportsmen. A score of villages are dotted about in the clearings, and are surrounded by carefully cultivated fields, in which Dura predominates. An unknown pharaoh of the thirteenth dynasty built, near to the principal village, a temple of considerable size. It covered an area, whose limits may still easily be traced, of one hundred and seventy-four feet wide, by two hundred and ninety-two long, from east to west. The main body of the building was of sandstone, probably brought from the quarries of Tombos. It has been pitilessly destroyed piecemeal by the inhabitants, and only a few insignificant fragments, on which some lines of hieroglyphs may still be deciphered, remain in situ. A small statue of black granite of good workmanship is still standing in the midst of the ruins. It represents Sovkotpu III sitting, with his hands resting on his knees. The head, which has been mutilated, lies beside the body. The same king erected colossal statues of himself at Tanis, Bubastis, and at Thebes. He was undisputed master of the whole Nile Valley, from near the spot where the river receives its last tributary, to where it empties itself into the sea. The making of Egypt was finally accomplished in his time, and if all its component parts were not as yet equally prosperous, the bond which connected them was strong enough to resist any attempt to break it, whether by civil discord within or invasion from without. The country was not free from revolutions, and if we have no authority for stating that they were the cause of the downfall of the thirteenth dynasty, the list of Manetho at least show that after that event the center of Egyptian power was again shifted. Thebes lost its supremacy, and the preponderating influence was passed into the hands of sovereigns who were natives of the delta. Zeus, situated in the midst of the marshes, between the Fatnitic and Sebenitic branches of the Nile, was one of those very ancient cities which had played but an insignificant part in shaping the destinies of the country. By what combination of circumstances its princes succeeded in raising themselves to the throne of the pharaohs we know not. They numbered, so it was said, seventy-five kings, who reigned four hundred and eighty-four years, and whose mutilated names darken the pages of the Turin Papyrus. 
The majority of them did little more than appear upon the throne, some reigning three years, others two, others a year or scarcely more than a few months. Far from being a regularly constituted line of sovereigns, they appear rather to have been a series of pretenders, mutually jealous of and opposing one another. The feudal lords who had been so powerful under the Usurtasans had lost none of their prestige under the Sovkotpus, and the rivalries of usurpers of this kind, who seized the crown without being strong enough to keep it, may perhaps explain the long sequence of shadowy pharaohs with curtailed reigns who constitute the fourteenth dynasty. They did not withdraw from Nubia, of that fact we are certain, but what did they achieve in the north and northeast of the empire? The nomad tribes were showing signs of restlessness on the frontier. The peoples of the Tigris and Euphrates were already pushing the vanguards of their armies into central Syria. While Egypt had been bringing the valley of the Nile and the eastern corner of Africa into subjection, Chaldea had imposed both her language and her laws upon the whole of that part of western Asia, which separated her from Egypt. The time was approaching when these two great civilized powers of the ancient world would meet each other face to face and come into fierce collision. End of Volume 2 End of Section 36 Read by Professor Heather and By in Carrollton, Georgia, in 2009 For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org